Thank you, Jill. I'd like my panel to please come and join me in the front. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So what's going to happen now, I'm going to allow the panel to just briefly introduce themselves. And I've given them very strict instructions not to give us their CVs. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll do them. So, um, and um, just to tell them us a little bit about themselves, and there will be two rounds of questions, then I will open the floor to everybody else. Hello everyone, my name is Walter Flores, I'm from Guatemala, and I'm the director of a civil society organization that carries applied research, also capacity building of grassroots organizations and advocacy around issues of governance, safety, and human rights. We are an, an interdisciplinary team which, uh, which engages with all the issues that we uh, the, the, the was presented uh, to us. Uh, good afternoon, Miguel San Sebastián is my name, uh, originally from Spain, but I represent here Umeå University in the northern part of Sweden. Um, I'm a teacher, <coughs> a supervisor, um, researcher, and I'm part of, uh, here I think I'm part of an observatory that we have in the northern part of Sweden called, uh, that works mainly with socioeconomic inequalities in health and healthcare. Hello, good afternoon, uh, I'm Charles. Uh, I'm the Dean for the School of Public Health at the University of Zambia. Afternoon colleagues, my name is Tulani Masilela. I work for the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation in the Presidency in the Republic of South Africa. I'm responsible for monitoring evaluation of health sector performance, but I also coordinate the overall approach for monitoring our national development plan. I'm also pursuing a PhD at the University of Cape Town. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rajini Bed. I work in India with the National Health Systems Resource Center, set up by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Um, we work to provide technical support to a large health system strengthening program of the government. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, as you can see, we have quite a diverse panel. So the first question, um, that I'd like you to reflect on. Um, Jill's presentation, she suggested that maybe this is just a change in turn, that the process itself and embedded research is something that has been happening for some time. Do you agree with that? Or do you think this is something new or something different? Or you just thinking just a fashion and a fad? I agree with that. <laughs> it has been going on for a long while. The difference is that when we have done that kind of research 10 years ago, you should be put out. No one wanted to hear about the research because you would bring things out no one wanted to hear. So what is different is paying attention that it is important to have that kind of research. But before you were sidelined if you were doing that kind of research. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I, I will agree to in that kind of uh, line um, that, um, to be honest, uh, when uh, when one week ago I received the, the email from Helen to, to be part of here and then I read the embedded, I, I recognize that I have read that, but I didn't pay enough attention to the term. And, and I was reflecting these days, I thought maybe because it was something natural in our, in our context. Um, I think we have been doing in Sweden this kind of or variations of this in the last 20, 30 years. And maybe I can put some brief examples, like um, uh, this issue about the, that was came here about the insider researcher, where somebody from one institution start to do a, a PhD within that institution, as uh, maybe Tulani mentioned now. Uh, we have had uh, recently a policeman working, uh, researching the police department about, uh, well, how the police is, is coping with uh, issues or related to to uh, uh, unaccompanied children, for instance, refugee unaccompanied children. Um, we have as well recently another graduated. Uh, we have an indigenous people, an indigenous people in Sweden called Sami, uh, and then we have had a nurse, a Sami nurse, doing a PhD about access to healthcare by the Sami people, and then I think she represent maybe it was maybe called uh, double embedded research, because uh, she was doing research within the health system, but in a particular ethnic group, so in her own ethnic group, 
meaning that okay, that that requires a lot of. I mean, that brings a lot of challenges. Too. Mm -hmm. And maybe these these are like what the. Uh, I have three minutes. Right? Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> this this might uh, they might represent as well. Well, might be a variation of junior embedded research, what I might call. It. I but we have the senior ones. Too. I mean, people that has already finished the PhD, but they are doing research as part of their own exercise. Could be publishing research or, or not necessarily public research. I think we have another model in Sweden that I will call, uh, and this will be a kind of operational embedded research. And, and we have the institutional embedded research where you have researchers where you have uh, managers and you have uh, policy makers that one have one, one somehow foot or one leg into the research. And at the same time, we have uh, researchers that have one leg into the Ministry of Health and then somehow through that leg they do research too. And I think we have another third model I would call maybe embedded researcher where uh, the Ministry of Health has positions for somebody from the academia, but not for doing research, but they are there as experts, uh, because they know about a particular area. So they are contracted to be experts, but they don't do research. They might do research, but not necessarily. So I think we have been working in these lines, but nobody in Sweden, as far as I know, talk about the better research. Mm -hmm. Charles? Yeah, I think well, I also agree with my colleagues uh, uh, but I think it's a rather, uh, it's a way of emphasis. Uh, embeddedness uh, is, a, is simply the, a, a natural way in which we live. We're embedded in our families, we're embedded in societies. But it looks like somehow, at some point, we move away from that embeddedness and either want to become Lord Rangers, <laughs> and you want to think just uh, uh, so different. So now there's, I think this emphasis, there's a way in which we should have this as a, as a structured way to handle our day-to-day -day research activity. My experience uh, uh, from Zambia and from an academic institution uh, at the university is that uh, uh, changing the way we think in this regard, uh, I think taken from Jill's you know, lecture, has to happen probably at a methods level. Um, uh, you might have your own competencies in this, but you should remember that there are other people of competence in another dimension. But knowing where you need them is a skill in itself. I do I just record it from medical practice. Just knowing when to refer a patient is knowledge in itself because what else you keep? And this is what has been happening. So people may not know when you need the other person. So they go on and on. And so it's not a common that you have institutions that even don't have you know, capacity building elements. And so, yeah, there's the methods part, and, and, and so there's need to have lead researchers. And I, 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 I we, have, we, are, we have been um, running a surveillance program for HIV in Zambia since 1995, and we did collaborate with Norway. And uh, uh, from that surveillance system, we have had people trained, you know, beauty capacity from health economics, from mental health, from epidemiology, from various dimensions more than 40 now in various you know, publications. So, yeah, that's a nice, another aspect. The second aspect is at an institutional level, and I think uh, Jill did a give a um, gra graphic element of individual institutions. And uh, in, in academic institutions, I, I don't know here in South Africa, it's not uncommon to have visible silos with no bridges, and of people working in their own vacuum and don't care what happens to their own family. So there's need to emphasize this, that we need to be better in each other and dictate our relevance, or else we are not relevant anymore. And so we have learned that also in, in, in Zambia. I want to share just one you know, illustration and, you know, where we have realized that we have so much program data uh, that is sitting you know, some of this, you know, is malaria data, people uh, has a data. HIV data, for example, never in the history of mankind have we had so, so much data generated, and a lot of it is sitting you know, out there. So what was learned in Zambia for the HIV data was that no one was analyzing it, and there was a gentleman who was moving there with a flash, a flash disk in his, it has all the data, and, uh, and we're not having access. So we come up with a strategy of putting up a uh, 
a way to analyze routinely collected data and record it in a for accurate search. Sustain sustainable evaluation and analysis of routinely collected health metrics data. And this is uh, to have low hanging fruit to enter with policymakers and notwithstanding the, you know, the challenges, the embeddedness, but have an, an entry where your research can have an immediate door where you can implement it. I thought I would just share that, that illustration too, and learn to remember that. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Madam Facilitator, Madam Moderator. <laughs> uh, I think that um, embedded research is far more than the traditional operation, operational research that is historically being, being conducted. Um, I think some of my colleagues have seen it as a continuum, uh, moving from the extreme left to, to the extreme right. Um, I, I see embedded research as, as raising far more ethical dilemmas than we have normally had in the normal traditional operational research. I think for, for many colleagues sitting in the room and, and, and colleagues who are doing the Oliver Tambo Fellowship Program, as uh, you know, I also did it a few years ago, doing a research project was pretty straightforward. You know, you Gain permission, access the research setting, you can identify the color of the data, you shade the way you're supposed to shade, you conclude the study. Embedded research is, is tricky. If I look at it from where I sit, when you are appointed in government as a senior manager, and uh, Mr. Marohani here uh, will attest to this, you, you sign what is called a uh, Secrecy form. There's a there's a top secret clearance form which you have to complete, and that involves state security agents coming to you, investigating your background, checking whether you have the integrity and the honesty to be trusted with state secrets, with state information. Research is about revealing. Right? Research is about disclosure. Research is about discovery. Now, you have undertaken that all this information that you are entrusted with, you are going to protect it. But now, you are undertaking a piece of work for academic purposes, so maybe just in collaboration with another institution. But the actual fact that you want to disclose and reveal are part of that which you, you signed that they are going to protect. As Jill said, it raises ethical dilemmas which even the Health Ethics Research Committee is unable to resolve. And one has to be very cautious in dilemmas such matters. Of course, there will be a way of going around certain things. Of course, there will be a balance that you strike between conducting research and also not violating an, an oath that you have taken. And I think lastly, the, the topic that you are investigating really tends to determine whether what you are going to do is embedded research or you're just going to collect information there that's waiting to be, to be discovered. If you are researching some of the key issues, the most important challenges facing the health sector, and where the problem is lying inside most of the time, that is where they have to take into account issues of embeddedness. But let me post it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, as I, I said in my introduction, I work for a group that started like a boundary spanning agency. So we support implementation, but we also do research. And uh, to me, that, that is the definition of embedded research, because we work with the ministry, but we also work with implementing agencies. And then we network with a group of organizations that help us in the research. So in a sense, when we support implementation, we identify the knowledge gaps, we convert them into questions with the help of researchers and then our partners in the undertaking of the research. So to us, that's a sort of a definition of embedded research. Um, policy makers have very short time frames, frames and when they roll out large scale programs, there's very little opportunity for them to step back, do evaluations, watch, because it's, really, it's a political process, the rolling out of a large scale program. So you have to have research constantly underway to either inform 
tweaking of the programs and tinkering at the margins or to really go to large scale overhaul. And so I'm going to give you a, a short example from a large community health worker evaluation that we did. Five years after the evaluation was launched, India has about 850,000 community health workers. And five years after the program was launched, after the initial hoo-ha of a big political program, we realized that the program was stagnating a bit. And a lot of the problems had to do, as Tirani said, with the people who were inside the system and actually implementing the program. But doing this evaluation enabled us to show to the world that, and to our government, that part of the problem lay with the implementers themselves, and part of the problem lay with the kind of funding they were providing to the support. So this kind of embedded research actually helped us to enable not a large scale overhaul, but certainly a lot of very important modifications within the program. So to us, as a boundary spanning agency, being able to identify knowledge gaps, convert them into knowledge and translation. And one of the, I think, an important part about the kind of research that we do is that our first level of dissemination is not necessarily publication, but the first level of dissemination is communicating those findings to the implementers in the field so that they get an opportunity to be able to review their programs and go there. And our partners in research are civil society networks, NGOs with research experience, and academic and research organizations, not necessarily um, market research agencies or development partners, because we believe they have a very important role in supporting the country's programs in the public health system, and therefore we tend more to partner with those kinds of agencies. So I'll stop now. Okay. So um, maybe before, let me start with you, um, Walter, since uh, you, you, had a, a vi you had a nibble at the cherry. Yeah. You didn't have a full bite. <laughs> so um, just to, to follow on, on this discussion, what is your sense with some of the ethical dilemmas that both um, Tulani and Rajani have raised, and how have you Manage, have you had the same experiences or, and how have you managed them? How do you speak truth to power when you realize that, you know, I think Rajani said it, sometimes mm. the problem is with the implementers themselves whom you need to work with in the future to give you access to do research with them. How have you managed that? Okay. Do I have to use it or no? Do we need to use no. it? No. Okay. No. So, so yes, I... My, my argument is that although we are talking of embedding now, but I don't think we are ready for, for real embeddedness. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we are ready, we don't have the right structure for it. And I'll give you two examples. About eight years ago, we wanted to, to study the non-formal mechanisms that were influencing the governance in the health system in Guatemala. Mm. And of course, the, the non-formal means nothing that is written. What exactly, who is influencing that? And we managed to have the interest of people that work in the Ministry of Health and Decision Making. Some were retired, but some of them were active working in the Ministry offices, some of them being the link with Parliament. Mm -hmm. So that was great. So we started collecting that, that was great. They just give us the whole mapping, mm. how pharmaceutical companies influencing the decision making, how they're, they're selling on medical supplies, all of that. When we tried to publish the study, we couldn't get it published because mm. they, I mean, of course, all these people were anonymous sources. No one of them was given to them. Mm. When we tried to publish this, they, they, they got back the, the reviewers and said, well, we cannot publish this because there's too many anonymous sources. And secondly, it's very difficult. How, how are you going to sustain it? You, you are, you're saying here that it's a very corrupt system. I said, mm. yes, it's very corrupt. That's what it's showing them. So, the, so, so they didn't want to publish. Mm. Uh, two years after, we got to publish locally in Guatemala by UNDP, but as an example of the challenges of public institutions, but they had to remove a lot of the references mm. about high-level corruption. Mm. This got published, but all of that. The second example that I can give you is that in Guatemala, there's serious problems with the, the processes or, and the systems of supply of medicines and uh, uh, medical supplies. Mm. So we wanted to study, do a series of case studies about governance issues happening at the provincial and district level with the medical supplies. And so we applied for a grant with a donor and they asked us that you have to have a, have to go to the ethical review in the country, you have to have a letter that the, the country is, is, is okay to the study. So we applied at the Guatemala, the review committee of the Ministry of Health, we never got the prevalence. Mm. We send several letters asking what happens, say, we cannot approve this kind of research. Mm. Why? Because it is not research. <laughs> so basically, with these two experiences that, uh, I'm talking 
I'm talking to you eight or six, four years ago, this is not considered research. I mean, from, from some sectors within the health system, this is not considered research. Mm. Which, of course, if you go to other social sciences, it is research. Mm. It is the core of the research, other social sciences, even in journalism. Mm. And the third example that I want to give is that in our view, the, the health system is not only the workforce and the bureaucrats, but it's also the people that pay for the system, which is the user of the services. Mm. So the other study that we consider ourselves an example of embedded research mm. is when we work with uh, marginalized rural communities to identify what were the barriers that they had to access services. Because there have been so many studies and nothing improved, mm. so instead of us coming already with our list of, of the barriers that are well known in the literature, mm. we went through almost a year and a half of in that process, of ethnographic process, to understand from the perspective what those barriers are, mm. and in four different indigenous languages. Mm. So it was a major mass of data and information mm. that we end up converting all of that into 22 different categories or barriers, and none of them are related to the traditional barriers that military health collect information mm. from. For instance, some of the barriers had to do with Ill illegal charges. Mm. No, no information system collects that information military health. Mm -hmm. It was illegal charges. Another common barrier was that the doctor or the nurse has, hasn't been showing up for several days. So mm -hmm. there is no way of connecting information. Just assume that the doctor or the nurse is going to work, but no supervision is actually on work or no. Mm -hmm. So that was another barrier that everybody knew the doctor not showing up. Mm -hmm. So why should we go? Mm -hmm. and, and, and like this, 22 more. Mm -hmm. So that's another example that for us it is embedded research. It is not, as I said, the health workforce, but at the use of the service, which in our view, that's their, their also part of the, of the health system. Mm. And a very important part because in the end, through, the, through the paying the taxes, they maintain mm. the system. Mm. And in one way, they are the main constituency mm. for a public health system. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, so what we've heard is that, you know, in some sense, there is just a, ch a name change in this embedded research concept.